This week, it's squirrels vaping, a mech mod exploding, and Matt Holman, the CTP chief of science, resigns from the FDA to work for Philip Morris. Ain't nothing to it but to get into it. I'm DJ Alex, and this is your Hunky Vape, Global 20 Vape Science Advocacy News for the week ending 29 July 2021. You know, last week's science article showed us that smoking eradication is in sight. But is that the reason for the FDA CTP chief, the chief of science, to resign? Or has this been coming for a long time? Cigarettes are like squirrels. They're perfectly harmless until you put one in your mouth and light it on fire. Listen, when I heard that the FDA chief of science resigned, the guy who just eliminated 99.99% of all vaping products in the United States resigned from the FDA to go work for Philip Morris. I had the same gut reaction that you did. Here we go. Another revolving door example of FDA corporate nepotism. Another federal official playing musical chairs into the industry that they just got done regulating. Just fantastic. This guy oversaw ICOS Heat Not Burn, not only get market authorization, but also the highly coveted modified risk designation, all the while committing regulatory arson to hundreds upon hundreds of mom and pop vape companies. He literally dropped a nuclear bomb on 7.8 million vaping products by blanket issuing marketing denial orders. Out of the 8 million ENDS products from hundreds of companies, the FDA only authorized three companies. And I'm sorry, but you can't really count Verve Disc from U.S. Smokeless Tobacco Company. That's actually all trio. Whoops. The parent company of Philip Morris. Literally. R.J. Reynolds, Logic Technology, that's actually Japan Tobacco, and Enjoy are the only companies that got a marketing order from the FDA. 21 products. 21 authorized products out of 8 million applications. And this guy was in charge of reviewing all the science. Yeah, I had the same gut reaction you did. Man, I hope this guy burns in hell. Karma needs to get its, get off its lazy butt, get into high gear, and dish out some payback. But then I came across Clive Bates' open letter to Matt Holman. From FDA to PMI, a sellout or a bold move for public health? Dear Dr. Holman, you are making an interesting move at an important time, and I want to write an open letter to you to remark on its significance. I am sure that many will criticize your move as treachery or a sellout, but this is a predictable knee-jerk reflex and overlooks the public health fundamentals. I hope you ignore the inevitable criticism and remain focused on the enormous public health prize that you can pursue in your new role. I think it is an ethical and high integrity move, and I hope you make the most of it. What? Why on earth would Clive Bates be cheering on Matt Holman? Clive Bates just got done ripping the FDA a new butthole at the e-cigarette summit 2022. 
why FDA regulation is such an almighty mess. First thing is the review process and what I call anti-proportionate anti regulation. First of all, if you have a cigarette product, no problem. Bedrock of the tobacco market. Secondly, are you a small company? Basically, forget it. The regulatory process functions as a size filter. It doesn't matter how appropriate your products are for the protection of public health. If you're not big enough, you can't play. Uh, do you have a flavored product? No chance. And then finally, the burdens and the complexity, opacity, unpredictability, and sheer wastefulness of this pro process is essentially bending the market out of shape. Essentially a dull monoculture of uh, products and crushing any prospects for innovation. The truly terrible review process. So that's my first concern. I'd oh, like did you to... want to respond? No, no, no. No, 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 no. no it's a lengthy speech to which there are, there are no good answers. Sorry, I was still on <laughs> complaint number one of, to the FDA. I was saying, what was it? Are we on 13 now? Yeah, I, I've got a few more as oh, well on my sleeve okay, later on. in the discussion. Uh, <laughs> um. Okay, let us now move on to my second um, and talk about uh, terrible risk perceptions. How risky do people think e-cigarettes are compared to cigarettes? Nearly two-thirds think that vaping is as harmful or more harmful. And then there's a large amount of confusion in the marketplace. Um, and then finally, nicotine, gigantic wrongness there. More than half of people think that nicotine is the primary cause of cancer in smoking, okay? But is FDA to blame? Yes, it is. It is to blame. And the reason is you can't get straightforward, sensible statements about these risks from anyone in FDA or anywhere on their website. We keep talking about over and over again for years now that there's just a lack of understanding and we need clear um, messaging um, and we need consumers to believe it because I think that is one of the challenges. I mean, you can have clear messaging, but if people don't believe the message, it's, it's of no use. Okay, but you can find a lot of things that actually reinforce those misperceptions. Okay, so they are part of the problem. And it's worse than that. And um, we come to our third area, because SDA, FDA has a gigantic budget for communications. We have what I think are truly terrible campaigns that exaggerate risk, create fear where there shouldn't be anyone, any, mislead young people, mislead adults, and use weird things like worms in the face, some kind of alien chrysalis structure or something. I don't know what on earth that is supposed to be. You get this sort of thing. We saw some of this earlier. Nicotine brain poison. What does that mean? What, is it, what are you actually communicating to the public with that? Okay, let me move on to the next area, what I call the distorted research agenda. I don't know if you were surprised, but I was. 43% of FDA's, uh, C, sorry, the CTP's budget goes into science. It creates weird incentives in the science community to find problems for regulators to address. Uh, you probably can't read it, so I've blown it up. The mission here, and I've highlighted the offending text, in order to create a world free of tobacco, uh, and this is the purpose, the mission, and related cancer and suffering. It doesn't start with the cancer and suffering and ask an open question about how we address that. It starts with an end point, the tobacco-free society, which in practice nowadays means a nicotine-free society, okay? So it's a war on drugs, prohibitionist kind of mindset sitting behind this that is hostile to the concept of tobacco harm reduction. Well, I definitely would like to see fewer combusted products on the market. Let me go on to my fifth thing. Uh, a little bit more depth on this one. Misunderstanding youth. Um, I feel very strongly about this, so stand by. Um, so this is, a, this is the profile of the uh, youth vaping epidemic, primary driver of policy uh, on vaping ever since. A moral panic, not science, not economics, not policy, a moral panic. It didn't subside when vaping fell away again uh, in the last two years. It's still there and it's still driving and it's powered by money from entities like the Bloomberg complex. First of all, frequent use is a much smaller share of the total uh, amount of vaping, okay? You find, you find that the frequent use um, is a very, uh, amongst non-users of tobacco, prior non-users of tobacco, is a very small share. Most of the frequent vapors were prior tobacco users. It's possible that for them, this was advantageous. This was a benefit to them. 
um, because it was a diversion away from smoking, uh, stopped them emerging from adolescence as uh, smokers. Um, it, it may have stopped them even initiating in the first place. I mean, we found products, we FDA have found them appropriate for the protection of public health, but I still can't convince people that they're less harmful than the cigarettes they're smoking. But I still can't convince people that they're less harmful than the cigarettes they're smoking. But I still can't convince people that they're less harmful than the cigarettes they're smoking. Adult, adult smokers are at great risk of very serious diseases. Uh, young people who uh, vape are not really at much risk at all of very much. And for some young people, vaping uh, or a non-combustible alternative to smoking will be protective and there will be a public health benefit arising from that. We try to take whatever approaches we can to communicate to the public, um, but there are a lot of restrictions um, as to what we can say, how we can say it, the process we have to go through in order to, to say it publicly that are, um, that, that are really challenging. And, and despite what people like you think, we do try our best to, to communicate that stuff. No, I do think you try your best. Uh, so, so, uh, that's why the worst going then what would have been otherwise. <laughs> but Matt, you do make choices about yes. how you implement it. So for example, right. made in FDA is this uh, essentially this new standard in which you have to show a differential between tobacco flavor and another flavor product if you want to put the flavored product on the market. Now, that is a that is a contrivance of FDA, a, a test that you have established for all flavoured products. Now that's a choice, not necessarily the right choice in my view. I mean, I'm sure we disagree on it. Whoa, 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 hold on a minute. Excuse me, Clive Bates, but I'm the one with Alzheimer's, not you. Have you already forgotten what Matt Holman said just last year at the e-cigarette summit 2021? Um, you know, I don't, I don't disagree. I know this may surprise people. I don't disagree with what Clive said. I mean, um, you know, I try to kind of get at a similar point in, in my uh, presentation, which is, you know, yes, we know there's a problem with, with flavors being appealing to, to children. I mean, we, we know that's an issue. Uh, we have plenty of data showing that. Um, but at the same time, we also, as Clive said, I mean, flavors are also what get adult smokers to switch from the most toxic product, combusted cigarettes, to a less toxic product, um, and, and and that's that's sort of the challenge. And so, um, I, I don't think um, you know this sort of um, you know necessarily a draconian um, sort of approach is going to be the approach that ultimately best benefits public health. I think we have to tackle this really with a scalpel and, and be very careful so that. Um, you know the phrase that you know we started using in the agency a couple of years ago is we want to allow an off ramp. Um, for current combusted cigarette smokers. And I think, you know, having flavored products out there um, may be necessary to do that. Um, and, you know, the other thing to be, you know, um, you, you know, to keep in mind is, you know, e-liquids are all synthetic. So technically all e-liquids are flavored. I mean, even tobacco flavored e-liquids are flavored. E-liquids are all synthetic. So technically all e-liquids are flavored. I mean, even tobacco flavored e-liquids are flavored. You see, he knows tobacco flavor isn't really a real flavor. It's all synthetic. It's also why he said that we need to use a scalpel to allow smokers an off-ramp from the combustion highway. You know, we, we do, you know, I think from a public health perspective, we do, um, I think need flavored products out there to see um, that shift down the continuum of risk of combusted cigarette smokers to these less toxic products. I don't think it's just the flavors that appeal to youth. I mean, there's this whole package. The product is not just the flavor. It's it's the labeling, it's the marketing and how that's done. If kids were otherwise going to pick up a, a combusted cigarette and, and now they're picking an e-cigarette, you know, um, maybe from a public health perspective better, or they did pick up a cigarette and, and they're going to continue to smoke those cigarettes. Um, you know, throughout their life, would it be better for those kids, you know, even even underage, to to switch to an e-cigarette? Um, I think, from an individual health perspective, you know, it is. So, in fact, if you watch the whole presentation from this year and compare his statements from last year, it becomes obvious that someone at the FDA was tying his hands. 
He continuously stumbles about this year. Looking at his body language with his hands in his pocket. We know exactly what kind of pressure he was under this year. No, I mean, we certainly recognize that there's a lot of experimentation with kids, right? And then there's been a lot of talk today, not just with tobacco products, right, but all sorts of substances. And so, um, you know, we're we're more focused or we're more concerned about, you know, the, the experimentation that leads to long-term, lifelong or, you know, many years long use. Um, and like you said, I mean, because that's in terms of health outcomes, we have a pretty good handle on how many, you know, what percentage of kids are going to go on to use those products the rest of their life. Um, we don't know that is with as much certainty with, with ENDS. Um, but I will say we went to the, you know, we, we, we focused or we, we spent a lot of research on products other than top market share, but we did prioritize the top market share because they represent over 95% of sales, um, you know, currently or, or, you know, over the last two years here. Um, because we recognize there are a lot of other products out there too, and we have a lot of applications, and we're doing our best to, to get through them as quickly as possible. We're doing our best to, to get through them as quickly as possible. We're doing our best to, to get through them as quickly as possible. We try to take whatever approaches we can to communicate to the public, um, but there are a lot of restrictions um, as to what we can say, how we can say it, the process we have to go through in order to to say it publicly that are um, that, that are really challenging. And, and despite what people like you think, we do try our best to, to communicate that stuff. No, I do think you try your best. So, as a scientist, Matt Holden gets what needs to happen. He understands that the FDA has a serious messaging problem. Yeah, you don't want kids to pick up e-cigarettes. But knowing that some will always choose risky behavior, they are the exact kids who would benefit from widespread availability of vaping products. He knows exactly who needs this. And age is not an issue. And he knows that compared to smoking, these kids, and in fact, all smokers need to choose the less harmful products. But they're not letting him say that or do that at the FDA. It all makes sense now. Let me ask you a question, all right? If you were in his shoes and saw all the science from all these applications, which we all know he's obviously seen. And he also saw his own family and friends not believe him when he talks about how these are harm reduction products. What would you do? Would you stay with an agency who is hell bent on Sticking with the same prohibition that they've used for decades? Or would you jump ship to a job where you could actually change what's happening to smokers' lives? You know, just last year, Philip Morris announced that they wanted to unsmoke the world. It's now become obvious why Matt is going to work for Philip Morris. With his scientific knowledge and his experience at the FDA, who better to have fighting for public health? Even Ethan Nadelman acknowledges when a senior tobacco control official decides to go work for Big Tobacco, one has to be suspicious. But in this case, it seems not just good for public health, but even courageous. For some of you out there, I know this little bit of information won't wash away the anger and hatred toward the man who oversaw the demise of your businesses. And I agree with Clive Bates saying Matt should do as much as he can, as much as he's legally allowed to, to explain his personal rationale for this move. Trust is something neither the FDA nor Big Tobacco has these days. But if the chief of science leaves the FDA to go follow the unadulterated science somewhere else, the message is clear in my book. Vaping is destined to eliminate cigarette combustion. It's just a matter of time. 
And unfortunately, time is something some of us just don't have enough of. I made this a while ago. Why PMTA is failing public health. Now, let me ask you this question. Where would you rather work? An archaic government agency known as the FDA? Or on the enterprise fighting for universal adoption of harm reduction? All right, all right, all right. Time to move on. So, have you heard about the French government's new vaping problem? No, it, it, it's not Emmanuel Macron with his vape again. This time, it's the new prime minister of France, Elizabeth Bourne, uh, discreetly vaping in the hemicycle. On July 19th, during a session of government, she discreetly used her vape indoors. Whoops! According to Public Health Code Law 3513-6, it's forbidden to vape in closed and covered workplaces for collective use. Sorry, folks, you can't make this stuff up. Here in the United States, our republic has all but abolished the legal vaping market. While in France, in the French Republic, their prime minister is vaping in session. So it's no wonder cheap beer, cigarettes, see sales bump amid sky-high inflation. Consumer prices rose 9.1% annual rate in June, the fastest pace in nearly 41 years. However, consumers aren't giving up their vices, just switching to cheaper alternatives. Nearly half of all consumers surveyed by the National Retail Federation said they were switching to cheaper alternatives to deal with the inflation. Given some of the pressures that we're all facing the past couple of years, I'm seeing a little bit of an uptick, actually, in general smoking and drinking. Milos Grick said, I think folks are leaning on their vices just a little bit more. Now imagine a world without all the disinformation about vaping. Just imagine a world where they didn't ban vape mail, where they didn't tax electronic cigarettes, making them more expensive than smoking. We all know exactly what would be happening right now. Everyone who smokes would simply switch to the cheaper alternative, vaping, and ultimately improve their health outcomes. And you know what? This would actually decrease their cardiovascular risks. Don't believe me? Well, here's the science to prove it. Associations of smokeless tobacco use with cardiovascular disease risk. Insights from the Population Assessment of Tobacco and Health Study. Cigarette smoking is strongly associated with the development of cardiovascular disease. However, evidence is limited as to whether smokeless tobacco use is associated with cardiovascular disease. 4,327 adults in the Population Assessment of Tobacco and Health Study were evaluated for cardiovascular disease risk. Comparing biomarkers for exposure for exclusive smokeless tobacco and exclusive cigarette smokers. So what did they find? Compared with cigarette smokers, smokeless tobacco users had significantly higher concentrations of total nicotine equivalents, but lower concentrations of inflammatory and oxidative stress biomarkers. Biomarker levels among smokeless tobacco users were similar to never smokers. Smokeless tobacco users who were former cigarette smokers had lower levels of inflammatory and oxidative stress biomarkers and biomarkers of exposure compared with cigarette smokers. Conclusions? Smokeless tobacco use is not associated with increases in biomarkers of cardiovascular disease-related harm and exposure. Compared with never smokers, despite exposure to nicotine at levels higher than those observed among cigarette smokers, these findings support the concept that increases in cardiovascular disease risk among cigarette smokers is caused primarily by constituents of tobacco smoke. 
other than nicotine. So it's no wonder tobacco majors spend $9.6 billion on R&D of risk-free smoking options since 2008, says exec. From Dubai, in Arab news we find, British American Tobacco and Philip Morris International invested $9.6 billion in the research and development of risk-free alternatives to smoking. Since 2008, PMI has invested more than $9 billion in the R&D of smoke-free products. Also, among PMI's professionals are over 930 scientists, engineers, and technicians committed to building scientific assessment capabilities, such as preclinical systems, toxicology, clinical, and behavioral research, and post-market assessment, according to the company's website. That's exactly what they need for PMTA applications. In order to evaluate the reduced risk potential of our smoke-free products, we have developed a comprehensive scientific assessment program that is inspired by standard practices in the pharmaceutical industry and in line with the guidance provided by the United States Food and Drug Administration for evaluation of modified risk tobacco products. Said Ignacio Gonzalez Suarez head of the scientific engagement Middle East and Africa. Our program follows the international quality standards such as good laboratory practices and good clinical practices, and since 2008 has resulted in over 400 peer-reviewed scientific publications and book chapters showcasing our data and methods. Myths about nicotine. Tan clarified many myths about nicotine and explained how it is essential to rely on evidence when making decisions. What matters is not just to believe what people say, but to be guided by the evidence, he continued. Not just consumers, but also public health experts like him and regulators often equate nicotine with cigarettes. Evidence has shown, however, that it is primarily the smoke from tobacco combustion and not nicotine that causes the health risks associated with cigarettes. Nicotine, he said, is only one of many chemicals found in cigarettes. British American Tobacco has also completed a study, which is yet to be published, on a clinical trial on one of the new category products. Views. This study looks at both scenarios, the Views user and the cigarette user. It will provide a snapshot of the differences in biomarkers of potential harm between Views customers compared with cigarette smokers. And from there, we can see if one indicator differs from the other in terms of biomarkers. Tan said that in the UK, there are major health regulators and medical associations that have contributed to tobacco harm reduction strategies. He cited Public Health England's report on e-cigarettes and said vaping was 95% safer than smoking combustible cigarettes. Based on their clinical findings labeled on their website, PMI also has found that using their tobacco heated systems such as ICOS positively impacts smokers' health. It's called harm reduction, folks, and it saves lives. It's so obvious. From Pakistan, published in The Nation, harm reduction recognized crucial for reducing tobacco-inflicted health burden. In a recent correspondence published in The Lancet, titled Tobacco Control, Getting to the Finish Line, the two health experts highlighted that four out of five of the world's smokers are in low-income and middle-income countries. In these countries, where most of the 8 million deaths caused by tobacco occur each year, rates of tobacco use are falling quite slowly. The case is the same elsewhere as the number of smokers globally has barely changed since the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control Policies were implemented 17 years ago. They are of the view that the missing strategy in the WHO FCTC policies is harm reduction. 
Harm reduction is an essential public health strategy that works on reducing harm from harmful substances, where abstinence is not a viable option. The same strategy is gaining popularity in tobacco control efforts, as well as many scientific studies and public health experts have identified it as the efficient method to reduce harm to adult smokers' health who would otherwise continue to smoke. Most people smoke because of the nicotine. While nicotine is not totally risk-free, it is not the main culprit behind the harms of cigarettes. Instead, scientific evidence shows that it is the cigarette smoke that contains over 6,000 toxic chemicals, a hundred of which are proven to be the cause of majority of smoking-related diseases. Thus, tobacco harm reduction removes the harm caused by tobacco smoke by eliminating the process of burning tobacco, presenting adult smokers who would continue to smoke with non-combustible alternatives. These alternatives, such as e-cigarettes, heated tobacco products, nicotine pouches, and snooze, are less harmful as they do not produce smoke and only deliver the nicotine, enabling adult smokers to easily phase out the use of cigarettes. All around the globe, the truth is starting to see the light of day. Yet the World Health Organization ignores science and doubles down on its prohibition and disinformation campaigns. From Planet of the Vapes, we find... Who Q&A, an absolute scandal. Nancy Lucas, executive coordinator of CAFRA, says that the only thing who gets right is spelling out what the acronym ENDS stands for. The rest, she says, can be completely squashed by science. A key question who poses is, are e-cigarettes more or less dangerous than conventional tobacco cigarettes. <sighs> CAFRA and any logical thinking person who understands the topic says that who should have unequivocally answered this with less harmful? Instead, it puts vaping and smoking on the exact same footing declaring that both tobacco products and ends pose risks to health. And the safest approach is just not use either one. If you were a smoker desperate to quit reading this Q&A, you'd likely stay smoking. Who refuses to differentiate between vaping and smoking? At best, it completely deflects from answering what are just very simple and straightforward questions. More so, who delivers lie after lie after lie? The fact that who even poses a question about whether vaping is more or less dangerous than smoking is a disgrace. Rather than giving a straight one-worded answer, who refuses to acknowledge international science? that has repeatedly confirmed vaping is considerably less harmful than smoking. About 70 countries have already ignored WHO's anti-vaping crusade and regulated vaping. Countries at next year's COP10 need to fully understand that millions of smokers' lives will depend on their discussions and decisions. It's well overdue for the WHO to follow the evidence, rather than winding up baseless and constant hysteria, said Nancy Lucas. Sorry, folks, I'm passionate about this because people are dying every single day. 1,300 people in the United States are dying every single day because we refuse to adopt harm reduction for cigarette smokers. So, I'm going to have another coffee. I'm going to enjoy another vape. 
and then we'll continue on in the UK. Mmm. Custard and coffees. Delicious. Okay, so since we're in the UK, the Grocer reports more than a third of convenience retailers want to ditch cigarettes. Some 35% of the close to 1,400 store owners questioned said that they would like to become an exclusively smoke-free retailer and help their customers quit combustible cigarettes. More than two-thirds said that they were keen to work with other local retailers to help smokers switch. And 58% said that they would collaborate with pharmacies, GP surgeries, and smoking cessation services to the same end. That, despite combustible tobacco products, including cigarettes and rolling tobacco, making up 68% of annual smoking-related sales, versus 32% with smoke-free products such as vaping devices and heat not burn products. Ah, you know what, folks? It's a roller coaster ride this week. It's not all peaches and cream in the UK. I did not inhale. Britain's plastic crisis laid bare after a squirrel was spotted casually puffing on a vape pen. The wild rodent was seen picking up the discarded electronic cigarette before chewing on the purple puffer. Rory Hosker, 37, filmed the shocking scene outside his flat at 9 a.m. yesterday as the squirrel scurried up to its dray in the tree with a device. The laborer of Leeds said, The irony was I was having a cigarette out my window when I saw the squirrel puffing on the vape. It really looked like it was trying to smoke it. I fear... It could potentially die if it bites into the battery. What? Are you kidding me right now? Seeing that made me fear for all the other animals potentially getting hooked on the flavors. Here we go. They ran out of body parts and kids to get hooked. So now the animals are going to get hooked on the flavors of electronic cigarettes. Littered e-cigarettes are a real issue now and only getting worse. Okay, okay, okay. I get that there's a problem with all the disposables that are out there. Because of the TPD requirements and the nicotine caps that are in place in the UK, well, if you're a cigarette smoker and you switch to a disposable, you have to go buy one or two of these every single day. And they're disposable. And if you get some careless people which there always are a certain percentage of in society, they're not going to dispose of these things properly. They're just going to toss them where they are. That's why cigarette butts are the most polluted item on the entire planet. But that's also what real vapes are for. Nobody's going to throw this on the ground for a squirrel to get. Unfortunately, the news gets worse in the UK this week. Vape explodes in factory worker Paul's mouth, blowing out several teeth. Paul, 39, from Beddale in New Yorkshire, had considered giving up his vaping habit completely when the battery of his vape was destroyed by a forceful explosion as he was using it. The factory worker now has to face a series of medical procedures to reconstruct his mouth and teeth. On the life-changing incident, Paul said, I'm not one for the whole look at me, feel sorry for me nonsense. However, being aware of how big the whole vaping industry is these days, I felt I had to say something. As someone who's been doing it almost 10 years myself, I couldn't stand the guilt of not speaking up and having this happen to somebody else. It happened at the end of a Friday afternoon as I was walking to my car after a long week at work. 
Paul added, Three upper teeth were completely knocked out and four other teeth badly damaged. Of the three teeth knocked out, two were recovered by a colleague at the time and were able to be pushed back in. While I was at James Cook. Paul also received heavy trauma to his tongue in the explosion, which makes it extremely difficult for him to swallow. Paul says the battery of the vape, bought from Amazon from a Chinese manufacturer, was the part which exploded. Wait a minute. We're going to analyze this one. He was using a Deja Vu DJV mech mod. Mech mod? With an E-Leaf Mellow 3 tank? But he says it was the E-Fest 3000 milliamp hour 18650 battery which blew up. Well, that's the only part that could blow up. But only if you're using it inappropriately. He is currently considering legal action and looking for an injury lawyer to take his case. Wait a minute. So let me get this straight. He is using an E-Leaf Mellow 3 tank on a mech mod. Let me ask you this. Number one, does that E-Leaf Mellow and a mech, have a mech mod, say, 510 pin? Does it stick out far enough to be safely used on a mech mod? He's been vaping for 10 years. He should know this. Number two, does that EFS 3000 milliamp hour battery have enough amperage to safely fire the coil inside that tank? Okay. So, if it's a perfect 0 0.3 ohm coil, it's pushing the battery almost to its limit. But, if for any reason the coil drops resistance or shorts out, you are way over the battery's limit. So, what do you think is going to happen? And let's not even forget that I'm sure somebody as careless as this guy didn't bother to put the battery in with a positive end facing the switch. You see, folks, the Deja Vu DJV mech mod has battery venting holes drilled into the switch. So, if the unfortunate incident happens where the battery vents, well, guess what? It would blow out the bottom of the mech mod and not into the user's face. All it takes is one careless moment. And this is what can happen. And people are shocked that I don't regularly use mech mods on YouTube. It's not that I have a problem with mech mods. If you're very knowledgeable and you're very careful they can be a great experience, but it only takes one miscalculation before a serious injury can result. I'll stick with my arbiter. Well, this Marvos X is really good. Needs a new battery. See that red light flashing? Thank God I've got the Ox for Origin SE. There are thousands of options out there. Well, that wraps up the Global 20 Vape Science Advocacy News for the week ending 29 July 2022. Once again, there were so many other articles that could have included in this report. Like how Greg Connolly, who founded the American Vaping Association, joined the American Vaping Manufacturers Association as Director of Legislative and External Affairs. Or how the TGA sues a Sydney e-cigarette retailer over advertisement. But it's already been a roller coaster ride this week. So how about I just ask you to please 
be good to each other. And my wish is always peace, love, and a hunky vape to end cigarette combustion. Have a great day.